Whenever the Holy Spirit speaks to you, whenever he leads you in something, once again, you always got to remember that he never leads contrary to Scripture, but you always need to respond to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about. I've seen that so many times in my life that God speaks to me about doing something for someone. And I'm kind of like, eh, you know, I don't want to do that. You ever been there? And then, you know, the Holy Spirit just really says, you know, to me, are you going to really disobey me? Are you really not going to listen to me? And it's always a blessing when I do what he says, when I do what he leads us to do. And so this morning, I just feel um, that I, I, before we get started today, because uh, I got a message that I want to give you, but I'm going to give you kind of a mini message before the message, all right? Two for the price of one. How many like two for one? Buy one, get one free? All right, so here's what you got. You buy one, get one free today. Here's what I want to say, because I, I feel led to do this. Uh, we have a couple families here today that we want to pray for, that we want to lift up. Um, David and Sheila Mullen, their son, Noah, many of you have followed this months ago in Hawaii where he lived. He was run over and hit. It was a hit and run accident and it was a miracle that he survived and they have been going through this and our church has been praying for them and so many of you have been lifting them up and they're here today. And uh, let's... Continue to pray. Their son is still recovering, and we're very glad for them. And then uh, Charles and Karen Addison as well. They're members of our church, and uh, just this week, uh, their oldest daughter, 37 years old, they found out she passed away in Florida. Now, anytime that you go through trauma, it's a difficult thing, but you've got to have people around you that will help lift you up and help pray for you. You say, well, I don't know what to do. Be there. Pray. Give words of encouragement. That means more than you can possibly know. Very, very important that we do that. But here's what, what I wanted to say to you, okay, in light of this. The devil, the enemy, is out to destroy you and your family. You do know that, right? Jesus said that he came that the devil came to kill and destroy and to steal. He wants to steal your family. He wants to steal your kids. He wants to steal your faith. He wants to steal everything in your life to cause you to turn from God, okay? He wants to kill your faith. He wants to kill your family. He is a liar. But thank God we've got some instructions on what to do. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's seeking you. But resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Can I just give you a, a quick pattern? You, you get attacked. You have things go off course in your life. You have a curveball thrown your way. Here's what God says. Humble yourself. In other words, you trust God, not your own strength, not your own power. You got to humble yourself and let God know that you need him. And then he says, cast your anxieties on him. So you humble yourself. You say, God, I can't handle this. You've got to. Anybody ever have a time that you're sleepy and you get in bed and you're looking forward to some Z's, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden the old brain starts working and you start worrying about things and those anxieties and how am I going to do this? And I thought this was going to be different. Anybody ever been there? Okay. He says, cast them on him. Cast them on him. And I got to be honest, I, I realize I'm the pastor, but I just this past Friday night, I got in bed. I was sleepy. I was tired. I was ready to go to sleep. And as soon as I put my head on the pillow, normally I'm out like a light. 
but I just began thinking and worrying and going over these scenarios and what if this happens and what that happens. And finally, I had to have a talk with myself. You ever have to do that? And I had to say, myself, uh, you had better cast all these things on God. And I had to pray. I had to cast them over to him. I had to roll them over to him. And then I was able to go to sleep. He said, we are to cast our cares. Be sober-minded. In other words, be serious. Be watchful. Be aware of what goes on around you. Uh, then he says, resist him. By how? By standing firm in your faith. When the enemy comes against you, you resist him, not in your strength, not because you have determination, not because you're good, but because you know who is. You know who is strong. You know who is stronger than he is. And what you do is you say, I'm going to resist you in faith. I am going to trust in Jesus. And he says, then remember, you're not alone. People around you in the world are going through what you're going through. So whenever you have something that could be crushing in your life, God says, remember, there are Christians around you not just in the church, but around the world that are going through similar things and sometimes just hearing from them can be an encouragement. And he says that after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, aren't you glad he's got a lot of grace? The God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, he's not left you, he's not leaving you alone, He's got a plan for your life. He's called you to the eternal glory. Notice what he said. Will himself. Jesus not leaving you. You're not alone. He had not forgot about you. He hasn't left you alone in the dark when you have pain and struggles and difficulties. He said he will himself uh, restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That, that sounds like something that I want in my life, and, and you do too. And so my encouragement today is that during those times of grief, during those times of challenge, that you resist him. And when you do, in faith, God promises he's going to establish you. Do we claim that by faith today, church? I believe it. Heavenly Father, I pray over these and other families that are going through difficult times. Lord, first of all, thank you that the blood of Jesus covers us. Thank you that you have given us the promises of God. Thank you that we know who wins. You have already won. And Lord, we thank you for that. And so, Lord, we pray that you, you've already defeated the devil and his demons, and we pray the blood of Jesus Christ over this place, over these people, over everyone that hears this message. God, that you would just minister to them and be with them and bless them, God. And Lord, help them to be able to cast their cares on you and realize that you do not leave them alone. And God, we pray that you'd bind the devil and his minions and the demons of hell. They would not be welcome on this property, on this place, in this service. That They would not be welcome in the homes of our people, but that God, that you alone, would get glory and reign. And so, Lord, we ask you for that. And we want to resist the enemy and his lies and his murders and his theft. And we want to trust in you. And God, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, I don't know why I needed to say that, but that's something I felt like the Lord wanted me to say. Maybe that was for you. And maybe that would be an encouragement to you. Well, today, the planned message is this. We've been talking about masks. That's why you saw that video, okay? We've talked about all kinds of masks that we wear, we try to hide behind. We've talked about recently the mask of shame and how that Jesus removes the shame from our life. Today, I want to talk about a very important mask. It's the mask of guilt. Now, it's going to come from a passage maybe that you don't associate with this, but I think you will be able to see it. When we read it together, Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to read 21 verses out of this passage, and I think that when you understand this, that you're going to see the grace of God and how that he can remove the mask of shame in your life and that you can go forward and serve him and have the joy of the Lord in your life. 
So here's the story. Adam and Eve had been created by God. They lived in the garden. You remember that, the Garden of Eden? It was perfect. Can you imagine never having a bad day? Never having an argument. A husband and wife that never had an argument, all right? It was perfect in every way. And God told them, he said, you're gonna be blessed. You can eat of every tree in the garden except one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, when you do, you'll die. And this was God testing their faith. And by the way, God always tests our faith. Next week, I'm gonna speak uh, from a passage in Genesis about Abraham. And God asked him to sacrifice his only son. Now, that brings up a lot of questions, doesn't it? Does God approve of human sacrifice? You've gotta come next week to find the answer, all right? So, hope you'll be here. But in this story, we see that man and woman, they succumb to temptation. And let's see what happened to them as a result of that. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, hold on, for those of you who are skeptics, talking snakes, really? Is that what we're into today, talking snakes? Well, understand that uh, some parts of the Bible are obviously metaphorical. They're very obvious, okay? Um, this was Satan, okay? Make no mistake about it. This wasn't just some uh, snake that decided to get up and start talking. This was Satan himself. Now, perhaps he possessed the snake. We don't know. We do know that demons possessed a uh, herd of pigs in the Gospels. Remember, Jesus cast uh, demons out and they went into a herd of swine. I love that word, swine, uh, in the New Testament and older translations. And uh, they destroyed them, okay? We know that uh, God spoke through an ass to Balaam. Read it in the Old Testament. And some of you have said, well, that's not that much of a miracle. God speaks through an ass every Sunday at this church. So maybe... <laughs> Maybe, I'm not sure. But notice what Satan said. Don't miss this. Did God actually say? You ever doubt God's word? You ever doubt God's promises? You ever, ever doubt God's love? You ever doubt God's presence? Of course you do. And that's how he attacked her. He said, did God say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it. Only one problem with that, she added to the word of God. God didn't say don't touch it. By the way, whenever we add to or take away from the word of God for our own agenda, for our own conscience sake, we always get in trouble. Okay? Uh, he said... Uh, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What is that? Well, the greatest sin is the sin of pride and it always leads to self-worship. We worship the creation rather than the creator. We worship ourself. How many times have we put ourself in the place of God? We, we are the ones that want to determine what is right and wrong. Well, that's God's job, not ours, but we often do it, right? We try to step in and be the one in control. We are the ones that want to step in and say, no, we have the answers. Well, there is that temptation. And so um, he said, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, by the way, every sin falls in those three categories. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. God knew and so in this story, all sin, any sin, you can put it in one of those three categories. Either it stems from our pride, it stems from the lust of the things that we see. Um, look, it, it stems from the lust of our flesh. 
But God says, don't do it. And then the eyes of both of them, and she said, um, she uh, took of the fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. You ever notice that sin always leads to cover up? We always feel exposed. We always feel vulnerable. That's what sin leaves us. And it goes on, it says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They had this special relationship with God that was hindered, that was broken because of their disobedience. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? By the way, God knew. He, God never asks questions for his sake. He asked them of us for our sake, okay? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman. <laughs> we're, we've been pretty good at, about that ever since. Kim, where are my keys? I don't know. I didn't have them last. Well, tell me where they are. You know, quit changing stuff around on me. We like to blame things, right? The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate as if he was powerless. By the way, in the original language, the idea here was that Adam, and it says there that he was there with her, and that he purposely, Eve was deceived. Adam was not. He chose that over his relationship with God. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent, the devil made me do it. We are good at saying that, right? The serpent deceived me and I, then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And this is a prophecy, by the way, um, this next part. He says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed, your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is a prophecy that Jesus would come and pay for our sins. Did, did uh, Satan bruise his heel? Yes, he died. Jesus died. Uh, the fact is, he died and was buried in a real grave. And I'm sure the first day Satan and all of his minions were dancing and they were all excited. The second day they were celebrating everything is all good. But on that third day, something happened. All of a sudden, death could no longer hold the king of glory down. Death could no longer hold the son of God down. And Jesus got up out of that grave on that third day. And he made it possible for you and me to be saved, to be saved. And he said to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, indicating that Probably before the fall, having babies would not have been painful. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. <laughs> I, I know that's not funny, but that just strikes me funny. That from sin became the, the root of the conflict between man and woman, between husband and wife. And he, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and husbands have a biblical reason not to listen to you, ladies. Just understand, that's what every man can claim this verse. I thought I told you. Well, the Bible said that Adam listened to his wife and look where that got him. <laughs> because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread 
till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. You say, well, that's just a small detail. That's an important detail because something had to die to cover their sin. Let me rephrase that. Something innocent without blame, not at fault, had to die for their sins to be covered. And we're going to see from this passage that we learn how to deal with guilt. Now, let me say this. You see from this passage that in sin, there began the problem with marriage, the problem with work, the problem with children, the problem with your relationships, the problem with conflict. We could go down the list. It stemmed from the sin of Adam and Eve. But thank God that in this narrative, there was a prophecy that one day there would be a Savior. And in the end, God himself clothed them with garments made of skin. In other words, something innocent died for them to be forgiven. And I don't think I have to connect the dots for you. You get this. Jesus Christ, the innocent, perfect Lamb of God, died in our place for our guilt. Now, I'm going to say this, and this may be something that you want to write down. This may be something you want to remember. If you only get one thing from this message, maybe this is what you should get. There is a difference between the feeling of guilt and the fact of guilt. Let me say that again, because I didn't see anybody writing it. I didn't see anybody tweeting it or Xing it or whatever it is now. So uh, maybe this will be an opportunity for you to invite somebody to our church. Our pastor said there is a difference between the feeling of guilt and the fact of guilt. And once again, I don't see anybody writing or moving, so I'm going to say it again, all right? I want you to say it out loud with me so I at least know that you're paying attention. Okay, ready? There is a difference between the feeling of guilt and the fact of guilt. Here's the fact. You're guilty. So am I. We're guilty of sin. Not a single one of us is innocent. You say, well, I, I've never done bad things. Well, herein lies the problem. Uh, you want to come to Jesus, you must do it by admitting your need for him. That's admitting your sin. In the most famous and greatest message ever preached in the history of the world was by Jesus, and it was the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Beatitudes, the first part of that message, he started with saying this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, that word poor, it doesn't mean that you're broke or that your bank account's running low. It means that you are absolutely broken and without hope. And unless someone else helps you, you have no chance. Do you know that's what you've got to admit if you're going to come to God, if you're going to be forgiven, if you're going to get over the fact that you're guilty and then be able to release the feelings of guilt that dominate so many of us You've got to come to God and admit, I, yes, I'm guilty. Yes, I've sinned. I'm poor in spirit. God, I cannot do this because I'm good. I cannot do this because I've kept commandments. I cannot do this because I've been a good person. Well, God wants us to focus on repentance. He wants us to focus on what he did for us so that we can release feelings of guilt that dominate us. I'm going to give you three thoughts. I'm going to give them quickly, okay? Number one, I want you to see the problem with sin. There's a problem with it. Sin produces death. That's a problem. It's not just physical death, but it's also spiritual death. God told them, the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in other words, the day you disobey me, the day you sin, 
You're going to be separated from me, spiritually speaking. Now, this is a problem. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, is the wages of sin is death. That's the result. I've had people ask me before, why did Jesus have to die? Couldn't God have just forgiven our sins? Well, the payment of sin is death. And the only way that our sin, our payment could be made for us was for a human being that was perfect without sin could die in our place. Only possible way. And, and, and then it had to be that God himself died and took our penalty for us. And that's the reason Jesus was born. We're getting close to Christmas, right? The reason that Jesus became the incarnate son of God. He was the second person of the Trinity, by the way. He existed in eternity past. And the father, when he said, you know what? Someone needs to pay for the sin in order for these human beings to be made right with me. Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. And he obeyed the father And what happened? He died. He had to become human because only as a human could he die because the Bible says God is spirit. They that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God cannot die unless he became human. And so what Jesus did for us, he was born of a virgin. Yes, of a virgin. He was a literal human being. He entered into this world like every other child ever been born on the face of this planet throughout history. He was born from a mother. And the fact is, though, he didn't have a human father, at least not a blood father. His Joseph adopted him. But he, being the son of God, became human, lived a perfect life, fulfilled all of the law for us, And as God and as man, he died as our representative on the cross, fulfilling what God the Father had said in the garden so many years ago. You're going to bruise his heel, (laughs) but he is going to crush your head. How many know that a heel bruise just makes you limp for a minute? But when you crush something's head, it's dead. It's over. And thank God, there's a problem with sin. Yes, there's a problem with sin. It causes spiritual death. I I dropped my notes. There we go. I feel like the guy that uh, was preaching to this church, and they did not like their pastors to use notes. And he wore a coat. He he was so used to preaching with notes, he didn't know what to do. So he, he came up with a system. He clipped his notes on the inside of his jacket. And every time he needed to make a point, he'd open up his coat and take a peek and he'd, you know, go on preaching. And he, you know, talked about in Genesis and everything and, and God said, and he, he'd look in the coat and he'd be like, yeah, and it'd remind him. And he didn't realize it, but his notes had slipped out of the little paper clip and fallen on the ground. He didn't know it. And he's getting up to a big point and he said, and the man who built the ark was J.C. Penney. And he went, (laughs) that's kind of the way I am without my notes. Romans 5, 12, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world and and sin, Adam sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone is sin. Understand that the problem with sin is this. It produces death. It produces separation from God and it produces guilt. Remember I said there's a difference between the feeling of guilt and the fact of guilt? We're getting to a point here. Hang on. Hang with me. Ephesians 2.1. In the past, you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sins. So that's the problem with sin. It separates us from God. Guilt produces fear and excuses. Well, it's not my fault. It's the woman. It's the serpent. It's the circumstances. That's just the way that I am. God, if you knew that I was weak, why did you put that in my path? You knew I was going to fall. This is your fault, not mine. Well, we come up with all kinds of excuses, don't we? Guilt causes blame shifting. We see it in the Garden of Eden. 
It, it causes cover-up. It causes doubting God's word, doubting his goodness, doubting his love, doubting his generosity. Think about it. God said, you may eat of every tree. Just don't eat this one. And the fact is, we doubt. See, the concept of guilt in the Old Testament is based on your action. You're guilty because you sin. The New Testament introduces another concept about guilt. Okay, it, it does include you're guilty because you sin. But in the New Testament, it introduces this concept. You sin because you're guilty. You sin because you're a sinner. Remember, a dog is not just a dog because it barks. It barks because it's a dog, okay? And in the same way, you're not just a sinner because you sin. Yes, you sin. You've fallen short. You're guilty. But the reason we are is because we are born this way. It doesn't mean that we have an excuse. It just simply means that we need a Savior desperately, desperately. So the best person in the world needs a Savior, a Redeemer. The most moral person need, and the worst person. Let me give you the last two thoughts. First of all, the problem of sin. The second is the promise of a Savior God promised this prophecy about Jesus, and God made a sacrifice to cover them with animal skins. Once again, could not be a clearer picture than the Lamb of God, the innocent Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God without sin who died in our place. He died so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be covered. It's a beautiful picture that uh, guilt, yes, we're guilty. But the question then becomes, are you hamstrung by your guilt? Do you live in it? Do you always go back and remind yourself of your past, of your failures? Do you secretly know that, man, I've got this bad stuff in my background. I hope they don't find out about this. And I've heard people say, boy, if they knew what I had done, the roof of the church would fall in when I go there. Do you live there? There's a difference between feelings of guilt and the fact of guilt. But let me come to the last point and the most important one. Yeah, there's a problem of sin and there's a promise of a Savior, but God provided a solution. What was it? It was Jesus, and you no longer must carry the burden of guilt. You say, well, I, I've sinned. Yes. And when you come to Jesus, he forgives your sins. And the Bible teaches us, and I'm going to use a theological word, justifies you. He makes it as if you had not sinned. In other words, justification is this. Jesus had a perfect account. He had all this perfection. He had all this sinlessness. He had all this being like the Father. And in our account, you know what we have? We have guilt. We have sin. We have failure. We have uh, our past. And what Jesus did on the cross, you know what he did? He said, when it's finished, you know what he did? He took his righteousness and put it in our account and took our sin and our failure and our guilt and he bore it on the cross and he put it in hell where it will be forever. And God himself says, you don't have to be guilty any longer. Oh, are we guilty? Yeah, you can bet your bottom dollar that we are, okay? But notice Hebrews 10, 22. We have been sprinkled with his blood, whose blood? The blood of Jesus, to free us from a guilty conscience. Now, don't undervalue the purpose of guilt. God sometimes uses guilt to drive you to him, to repent. You remember what it was like when you did something you weren't supposed to do as a kid? And then this was back in the day when we had phones in the house, you know? Anybody have one of those phones that had an extension cord that reached from here to the back of this room? <laughs> you know? And if you had two phones, your little sister was listening in when you were trying to talk to your girlfriend. Well, I have no idea what I was going to make a point on that. <laughs> 
that was not a dramatic pause. That was a pause because I forgot what the point that I was going to make because of that. But here it is. He said in Hebrews 10, 22, we've been sprinkled with his blood to free us from a guilty conscience. Oh, I know what I was talking about. I was talking about being guilty, feeling guilty. And every time the phone would ring, somebody was calling to tell on you what you did when you were 15 years old. Anybody ever been there? And so God says we've been sprinkled to free us from a guilty conscience. Our bodies have been washed with clean water, so we must continue to come to him with a sincere heart and a strong faith. This word sincere is an important word. Some people think that if you're sincere, you know, it, it's okay. You may be wrong, but you're sincere. That's not what this word means. This idea of sincerity, it is an undergirding of truth. Literally what it means, you come to God standing on his sincere, true undeniable word and that's good news you know why because sometimes the devil tries to bring up your past you've been forgiven you put it under the blood of Jesus Christ and he keeps on bringing it up he keeps on bringing up that failure he keeps on bringing up that time or those times and you confessed it and you white knuckled it in church he said I'm never going to do it again and before the week was out you did it again and he keeps on reminding you that you're guilty. It's a fact. <laughs> but every time the devil brings up your past, you just go ahead and bring up his future. Because the fact is, he is going to be cast in the bottomless pit in hell for all of eternity. Read the book of Revelation. It says at the end, people are going to say, is this the one that deceived the nations? Is this the one that deceived us? Is this the one that tricked us? What is the point? God says that when you are forgiven, you are no longer guilty. And that's good news. Man, I could talk about that forever. Psalm 32, 1, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. I've told you this before, but in the book of Psalms, particularly, many times the word blessed it gets translated in English from a Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word is a plural word. Now, you say, why is that important? You're boring me. I'm about to go to sleep. This is not English class, is it? No. It's a word that means that you're doubly blessed. So, so let's read it this way. Blessed, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. It can also mean happy, happy. That's interesting, isn't it? Happy, happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Is there anybody here that's happy that your sin is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ? Now, wait a minute. It's more than just being doubly blessed and happy about it and all this and joy, joy, happy, happy, joy, joy, you know. We're in a stimpy, anyone? All right, anyway, sorry. I used to love that cartoon. Even as an adult, I loved it. But you know what the word means? Bless, bless. It means you're blessed now and in the life to come. I have been blessed with heaven. I have been forgiven. My sin is covered. My sin is under the blood of Jesus Christ. I am no longer guilty. Hallelujah. And one day I'm going to live in the fullness of God's grace. But wait a minute. How many of us believe that? But here, all we do is live in the past. And all that gets brought up to us is all of our failures. And how many times we've failed and how much we're guilty. And we cannot even get past it. We think God can never use us because we are guilty. <laughs> but hold on. You're not just blessed in the life to come. You're not just forgiven and going to heaven one day. You're blessed in this life. Hallelujah. God says, blessed, blessed, happy, happy is the person whose sin is forgiven and whose transgression is covered. That's what God has done for you. And you can take off the mask of guilt. 
Because when you have been forgiven, when you have been justified, guess what? You are not any longer. You are no longer guilty. Do you realize that's the only way you could go to heaven? I mean, because when we stand before God, he's not going to, I mean, God's not dumb. He's not blind. He's not forgetful. When it says he puts our sins, he removes them as far as the east, east is from the west, which is infinity, uh, or that he uh, remembers our sins no more. God is, doesn't have a memory problem. You know what God's doing? He is willfully covering your sin with the blood of Jesus Christ. And when he looks at you, you know what he sees? He sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. He sees the works of his son. That's what he sees when he sees you. And oh my goodness, when you get that, you are blessed, not just in the life to come, but you're blessed now. You are freed to be able to live for him. And then the last thing, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation, no guilt. Are you guilty? Yeah, I'm guilty. I, I've sinned. I've fallen short so many times. Has God forgiven me? Yes. Has he put it under the blood of Christ? Yes. Has he cleansed my conscience? Yes. And I am blessed in, in heaven. One day I'm going to be there. One day I'm not going to be in the presence of sin any longer. One day I'm not going to be around sin. I'm not going to sin anymore. But thank God I don't have to wait till then because I am blessed now as well as in the life to come. And I can live in the truth that God says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> and so when, the devil, when you put your faith in Christ and he has forgiven you, then when the devil comes to you, you just look at him and say, not guilty. When he tries to remind you of your failures, you just say, sorry, not guilty. Not guilty. Why? Because of Jesus. So here's the question. What do you do with your mask of guilt? When you're guilty, repent. It does drive us to him. And by the way, the word repent is a very misunderstood word in the Bible, and it's a very important word. It means to agree with God. It means to change your thinking. You cannot change your life until you change your thinking. And you cannot think best until you think like God thinks. And, you know, I realize the devil makes sin seem so wonderful. Just like with Eve. It was beautiful. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Yeah, it's tempting, but it's not worth it. And here's what God says. Turn your guilt to him. And therein is the good news. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help all of us to realize that apart from you, we are nothing. Apart from you, we cannot be made right with you. Apart from you, we, we don't have the goodness that is required to go to heaven. But thank God that you do. And you give it to us freely. Freely. And God, we thank you for that. Before I finish my prayer, I wonder if there's anyone today that would say, Pastor Richie, I need that grace. I need that forgiveness. I need Jesus in my life. Would you let me know by raising your hand and say, I need to receive Christ today? Anybody? Just nobody looking but me. I need Christ in my life. I see your hand. You can put it down. Maybe you'll say something like this. Pray something like this. Dear God, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and you rose from the grave. And right now I'm asking you to forgive me. Cleanse me from my guilt. Make me right with you. I give myself to you. Forgive me of my sins. If you'll say something like that online or in the room, let us know. If you're online... Let us know at the bottom of the screen that you pray to receive Christ. You can click that, that you pray to receive Christ today. If in the room, please stop by the room on the way out and let me know that you pray to receive Christ. I'm going to let you know how happy I am, and we're very excited for you. 
I wonder what you need to do with your guilt. Is there anyone in the room that would say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I'm dealing with some guilt. I'm dealing with some problems. I see your hand, lots of people, lots of people. If we're honest, all of us could raise our hand. I want you to realize that God has promised that you can release it to him. And when you do, you'll be free. Wouldn't that be great to be free and free from the guilt that drives us and burdens us and holds us down? Jesus, thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. We want you to know that we love you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad you came today. Just a couple things as we wrap this up. Number one, if you're new or first time in a long time, stop by. I'm going to go back here to the room. If you're interested in knowing how to get connected to our church, we, we've always done next step classes and membership classes and all this kind of stuff. Um, we're going to try to make it flow a little easier. And so just pop in. It's not going to be an hour or anything like that. But I do want to talk to you, if you're interested in joining the church, of what to know. What does it mean? How do you do that? How do you get involved? Um, and so I'm going to be in that room, uh, first room to the right when you're walking out, okay? And so you can stop by there. If nothing else, just stop in and say hi, all right? Thank you for being here today. So if your next step is getting connected, getting involved, stop by. If your next step is serving, stop by. Let me know. Hey, I'm interested in doing something. We have a fond uh, saying that we're fond of, participation is membership. Just because you join up, I'm a member of Facebook, and it looks like that I'm on it a lot. I'm not. I rarely ever go on it, and, uh, you know, whenever I see something on it, I'm surprised normally because I'm like, oh, three months ago, uh, this happened, and I, I should have been aware of that, but I didn't look at Facebook, all right? So people do that for me, all right? Uh, that sounds very arrogant. That is, I have people that do that for me. I cannot be bothered with this social media stuff. No, what that means is I'm 59 years old, and I do not like social media, okay? That's what that means. Um, but if you would like to, I'm a member of Facebook, but I don't participate much. You want to be a member of this church? It's not about signing a piece of paper. You know what it is? It's about participating, getting involved. Maybe you'd like to get involved. Or maybe you'd like to give. Or maybe you'd like to be in a small group. We are done with small groups for this semester. We'll start back up um, after the new year. So I hope you can be involved in that. All right. 